Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and today we're going to be talking about the greatest orc ever, God School Mag Orc Thraka. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions, please comment down below. And I hope you guys enjoy this blast from the past. This is one of the very first uh, lore videos that we ever created. So you're still going to see the facts on the actual screen uh, and, and all that good stuff. But I decided to put all of it together so you can have this just really long video and listen to it while you paint. So with that said, let's get into 40 facts on God School. Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka is an orc warlord of the Golf clan and a mighty prophet of the Wa. He is the single most influential orc in the galaxy in the late 31st millennium and billions of greenskins march to war in his name. The Wa, led by Gazgul Thraka, is different than any other orc invasion. Most orc Wa's are seen as temporary events that become little more than footnotes in the history of some random race. Gaskul Wag shakes the foundations of the galaxy in a war of total domination. He is no mere orc, but rather the living prophet of the orc gods Gork and Mork. Gaskul is their mighty instrument of destruction made manifest. Gaskul has a vision for the future unlike more orcs before him. Gagskul began his climb to greatness at the edge of Segmentum Solar on the now frozen orb called Urk. Urk's history has been largely forgotten, buried beneath successive invasions, but it was first named Urkolius after it was founded by the exploration fleet launched from Terra during the Dark Age of Technology. The planet was part of the Zornian star system and the tides of the warp flowed strongly to that point, making it an excellent hub. Humanity prospered on Eurocleus, for it was a world rich in minerals and within a few hundred Terran years, the colonies had grown to thriving cities and busy spaceports. It was all the activity that drew the orcs to the planet of Eurocleus. They burned the planet to the ground before disappearing aboard their great junk fleets, leaving behind their reproductive fungal spores that would one day rise again. Between barren periods, the world became an Eldar outpost, the home of a cluster of Spindorians and a Frud Warren. At times, the long, dormant orc spores would erupt, and swarms of greenskins would develop in some secret corner of the planet. It was not until the time of the Great Crusade that mankind returned again in force. It was the Dark Angel Space Marine Legion who cleared the planet of its life forms and again planted the flag of humanity upon it. For over 2,000 standard years, mankind mined there. They built hive cities and tethered spaceports to its twin moons. Minor Xenos raids occurred, but it wasn't until near the middle of the 32nd millennium that a great greenskin wall swept the system. It was the largest recorded orc attack upon the Imperium to that time, with dozens of invasions blazing across all five segmentums. Soon the Zornian system fell into orc hands, as Eurocleus was overwhelmed by the Greenskins, the last survivors of that world boarded the vast star freighter Dominion and escaped into the suddenly shifting warp. The tides of the warp had altered, making the Zornian system no longer easily accessible. Thus began a long period of stagnation for the orcs. For nearly 8,000 standard years, Eurocleus, renamed Urk, was a battleground for warring greenskin tribes. At first they fought over the ruins of the hive cities, clashing over the best loot. These battles devolved as did the piles of plunder they fought over. No leader proved large enough to gather more than a handful of the tribes or clans beneath him, so an equilibrium of squalor became the way of life. It was during this turmoil that Gag School was born. The Imperium of Man may have had unsuspecting hand in creating the most formidable orc of his era, perhaps of all time. After many Terran years of fighting orcs and monitoring their presence in outer lying systems, the Imperium had learned that under the right conditions, even sporadic orc populations could multiply at a startling speed. The rise of a strong warlord could unite the feuding clans, triggering a mass release of spores. 
Should this gathering grow large enough, it could act as a psychic beacon to orcs on nearby planets, drawing them into a swarming migration built with frightening intensity. In less than a Terran decade, orcs could go from being a minor nuisance to the world's dominant species. The Imperium found that if a rising WA can be detected and countered early enough, the orcs can be broken and dispersed at little cost. Thus, in the Zornian system, the Dark Angels had established a range of monitoring stations coordinated by a command sanctum in a barren mountainous region of Orc. The hub routinely fed scans and other information back to the nearest Dark Angel vessels. In this way, the Greenskin's numbers were regularly checked and the Dark Angels could also keep track of the feral human populations of that star system, for they were always searching for new recruits from which they could draw battle-tested warriors. It was this very monitoring station that set Gag School on his journey to greatness. The young warrior Gag School was a trooper in a Goth clan warband that took part in a raid upon the Space Marines Command Sanctum. Although it was hidden atop a remote mountain crag on Urk, it was not safe from the orcs. Always seeking scrap, the Greenskins discovered the hidden base and began to dismantle it. During the initial rush to claim the base, Gag School was hit in the head by a bolter shell, a shot that pulverized a large section of his cranium and turned a sizable portion of his brain to absolute mush. It was quite possible that the young and profusely bleeding Gag School might have been left for dead then, but there Gag School got back to his feet, a sign of toughness and grit that any goth would respect. It was widely known that a crazy Death Skull's pain boy was paying those who brought him fresh material to work on with a good sum of teeth. His own mob guided him onwards. He was a stumbling wreck and had to hold his bleeding brains in with both hands, but they eventually reached the Death Skull's outpost of Rustpike. There, his own mob traded Gag School to Mad Doc Grotznik for the sum total of three teeth and a new choppa. Immediately after Mad Doc Grotznik performed his pivotal operation, Gag School sees green visions for the orc gods Gork and Mork. Grotznik had replaced part of the goth warrior skull and brain with bionics, wires, and squig sinew, holding it all in place by riveting on adamantium plates. When Gag School awoke, he could see more clearly than he ever could before. This had little to do with his eyesight or new bionic eye which truthfully was always a bit out of focus. Rather, for the first time in his short life, Gag School awoke with a brand new vision. The vision gave him a destiny to rally all of Orcdom and lead them onto the greatest wall of all time. It was now his belief that he was in direct contact with Gork and Mork, the great green gods of the Orcs, and Gag School realized that he had been chosen as the living embodiment of their divine wishes. The first to fall beneath Gag School Ironshod's heel was the Death Skull's warlord, Dragmech. Gag School had just emerged from Mad Doc Grotznik's grimy tent and was still rubbing his shiny adamantium plated plate when Dragmech approached. Dragmech demanded to know what a goth was doing within the boundaries of Rustpike. Behind Dragmech, his entourage of knobs laughed in anticipation of a fight. Undaunted by the massive combi weapon that the Death Skull's warlord was waving in his direction, Gag School advanced. As the Death Skull warlord saw this, he opened fire upon Gag School. Perhaps it was a stroke of divine intervention to save their prophet from Gork, or possibly Mork, but Gag School advanced untouched. So savage was the pummeling that Gag School delivered with his bare hands that Dregmech's knobs cheered on. The headbutt delivered from Gag School's newly armored skull finished the job with a resounding clang. Straddling the pulped body of his foe, Gag School announced that this was only the beginning. After killing the Death Skulls, Warlord Dregmech Gag School Mag Uruk Thraka announced to the onlookers that he was the prophet of Gork and Mork, and anyone that was looking to suffer the same fate as their former warlord could step up. Gazkul fought the Death Skull orcs for a solid hour, a battle from which the Prophet suffered nothing more than a scratch. 
Once the orcs from the Rustpike camp bent their knees to gag school, they realized he has grown larger right before their eyes. By crushing the tribes within reach of his new stronghold, Gazkol began to increase his horde. In addition to the death skulls that had followed Dregmek, there were now several goth mobs beneath the young warlord. As stories of Gag School's deeds circulated throughout the scrap heap, villages and makeshift fortresses of Urk, orcs began to leave their tribes and head to Rustpike to become bigger warbands. Rustpike grew so overcrowded that it was impossible to spit and hit the ground, so Gag School decided to move west. It was on the cracked plains of the big wasteland that Gazkul met his first setback. He had entered the territory of the Bad Moons, the richest and most envied of the local clans. The Bad Moon leader was Warboss Snazdaka, and none could match the mix of firepower and mobility that was his bright yellow battle wagon brigade. When Snazdaka saw Gazkul's hordes marching across his lands, he ordered his totem pole raised and his tents collapsed. During his retreat, Snazdaka and his boys were able to lob a few shells into Gazkul's hordes before driving off out of range of retaliation. Gazkul had engaged into a battle of wits and tactics and he was prepared to show his skills. When he had his lads sabotage the supply dumps where Snazdaka refueled his battle wagons. Gaskul then gauged the wind and ordered several shanty towns to put to flame. The thick smoke drifted over the cracked plains, hiding the exact whereabouts of his troops' movements and making it impossible for the Bad Moon to flee until Gaskul's infantry was right on top of them. Most impressively, Gaskul had coerced the fastest orc on Urk to join him by all out racing him in a one-on-one -on -one duel of speed. All who saw it agreed that only the divine might of Gork and Mork could have allowed the now hunking goth warlord to outpace the grand speed boss Snazfrag of the evil sons. Finally, Gazkul overcame the bad moons and defeated the war boss Snazdaka. The defeated bad moon watched as Gazkul ordered the bad moon Max to fashion an enormous power claw from the rubble of their ruined tanks. So large had Gazkul's horde grown that no warband on Urk could hope to stand before his sweeping onslaught. Only the foolish or the stubborn even attempted to stand apart from the meteoric rise of the great Greenskin champion. One such stubborn fool was Snakebite Warboss, Grudbolg. It was a long bloody solar week to subdue the snake bites under Grudblog, and Gag School was forced to decapitate the scarred old monster twice before finally winning his loyalty. When challenged to a headbutting contest by the hulking goth champion Ugrak, Gag School was like a pile driver, sinking his foe a full foot into the ground and knocking him unconscious. Ugrak's knobs were so stunned that their undefeated leader had lost that they did not see Gaskul striding towards them. In a fury, Gaskul worked his way through the knobs, leaving each senseless. When the heads of Ugrak and his knobs finally cleared, they quietly, sensibly pledged eternal alliance to Gaskul. It took six standard years for Gaskul to fully subjugate Urk. Inspired by the spirits of the rising Wa and Gaskul's impassioned speeches about conquering the stars, the orcs swarmed about the planet's surface in a flurry of activity. A fleet of ramshackle void ships began to arrive on the planet. As orcs from across the Zornian system felt the siren call of a Wa and they were ready to join. For the first time, groups of mech under Gaskul's control worked together. Their crazed energies flowed as they cobbled together the vast battle fortresses, new weapons, and towering engines of destruction. All of Urk's greenskins moved with a sense of destiny and overwhelming realization of their duty. Suddenly the sun that always lit the planet of Urk dimmed 
their superstitious orcs dropped their weapons and stared upwards at the celestial phenomenon. Gazkul assured the quivering greenskins that this was a sign of Gork and Mork. Gazgul told the other greenskins that Gork and Mork was telling them that it was time to leave Urk behind, that it was time for the galaxy to feel the might of the growing Wa. He told his followers to stockpile all the arms and ammunition they could, for they were leaving within a week. The orcs on Urk knew they did not have enough ships to leave the planet, but some orcs wondered how this might happen. A single glare from Gag School was enough to silence their questions. The next morning, the warp currents changed again, reverting to patterns similar to those of ages ago. The warp deposited an enormous space hulk onto real space, vomiting forth the void craft right onto the Zornian system. The hulk now drifted in Urk's orbit, blocking out the light from the flickering sun. Gag School turned to his mechs and ordered them to secure the Space Hulk using super heavy tractor cannons. A few of the available spacecraft were equipped with harpoon rockets and they fired these off to tether the colossal Space Hulk to one of Earth's twin moons. Construction on the rockets that would take the orcs to the Space Hulk began. There were perhaps 100 constructions worthy of being called ships, while other craft were built to complete only a single journey. Gag School led the exodus from the planet in the biggest ship there was. Many orcs did not make the trip to space due to prematurely detonating while others exploded on impact with the Hulk. The Space Hulk was not unoccupied. As soon as the first wave of orcs landed, they were attacked by demonic entities. Burna Boys set the demons aflame while Speed Freak Boys launched themselves from cargo ramps guns blazing. Gazgul himself led the spearhead that fought its way to the center of the Space Hulk. There, at the black heart of the jumbled amalgamation, was an ancient voidcraft, none other than the vast star freighter Dominion. After leaving Urk to escape the orc attack, the voidcraft became lost in the warp, its terrified human cargo attracting the horrific creatures that dwelled there. Where its warp engines had once been located, there was now a huge warp rift, where demons poured out, looking to destroy the intruders. Mad Doc Grotznik led a charge to win the landing bays of what must have been an old Imperial transport. The orcs needed the old Imperial crafts to aid with the transport efforts. It was Urgrax Uglies, the Goth Knob mob, that fought their way to the asteroid embedded deep within the space hull and in the end only Ugrax Combi Scorcha swept the path clear. Orc tank busters were hunting the soul grinders, crawling through the air vents to send rockets corkscrewing onto their unnatural foes, blowing them apart in sprays of flame and ichor. The fight to take over the demon-held Space Hulk was a bitter battle through ever-changing confines. Neither side showed mercy, hacking at each other in the narrow corridors and turning vast cargo bays into slaughter pits where entire armies crashed headlong. The fighting took solar weeks, during which time billions of greenskins were airlifted off Urk to join the fray. Finally, Gag School reached the warp rift and ordered his men to fire all they had at the rift only to have their firepower absorbed by the immaterium. It was Gag School's headbutt that closed the rift off. Whether it was the force of the blow or the latent psychic energy within him, it was done, and the demon threat ended. Gag School named his Space Hulk the Word Killer. The orcs explored the bounds of the vast Space Hulk, finding strange technology, ancient machines from humanity's lost past, and other apparatuses beyond their comprehension. How long Gag School and his followers drifted in the warp is not known. Time passes strangely there, and orcs keep no records. Gaskell and his boys explored the bounds of the vast Space Hulk, finding strange technology, ancient machines from humanity's lost past, and other apparatuses beyond their comprehension. Orc Burna Boys worked with mechs and death skulls to rip apart the Space Hulk for use for stampas, 
battle wagons, and battle armor. This removal of metal plates from the Space Hulk was what allowed the warp entities to re-enter Word Killa. Several more demonic incursions plagued the journey and Gazkol had to drive out the worst of these warp offenses personally. When the orcs were all by themselves on the Space Hulk, they fought each other for scrap metal and squigs. There was always an abundance of violent WA energy, and the orcs thrived and multiplied. Soon, every cranny of the Voidcraft was bursting with more greenskins. A sudden jerk alerted all the orcs on the Space Hulk that Word Killer had ripped back into real space. Gaskol's voice boomed out of the speakers and down corridors, telling all to prepare for battle as Word Killer smashed aside defenses and trampled picket ships. The orcs had emerged at the edge of the star system vital to the Imperium, heading straight for the core planet. Before them sprawled the immensity that was Armageddon. Armageddon was an industrial giant. The planet lay roughly 10,000 light years to the galactic northeast of Terra in the Segmentum Solar. It was a vital node of navigational channels and its countless manufactorums supplied munitions to the Astra Militarum regiments throughout the Armageddon sector and beyond. No force in the galaxy could now stop Wordkilla from crash landing onto Armageddon. Guided by his visions, Gaskol did not wish to halt his flight. Rather, he welcomed the headlong plunge towards the world below. Gaskol was on a collision course for greatness. Surrounding Imperial fleets, long-ranged missiles and a planet's orbital defense lasers did their best to stave off the inevitable. Their firepower managed to shear away a few chunks of the oncoming Space Hulk. The deep impact of the landing shook the entire world and its blast wave caused untold devastation. A cloud of debris shrouded the sun. Hundreds of thousands of orcs were instantly vaporized by the cataclysmic contact of the landing. Their losses, however, were but a tiny faction on their number. As the shock faded, a few of the orcs realized that they should all have died in that epic crash. Gaskol claimed it was the protection of the gods, although the force field projector absorbed the brunt of the impact. Gaskol divided his followers into five distinct hordes, each under one of his most powerful warlords. These were leaders Gaskol had subdued upon Urk, ferocious orcs that had learned by fighting alongside him. With a wave of his power claw, Gaskul launched endless columns of orc war machines and living seas of green-skinned infantry onto battle. The Astra Militarum and the planetary defense forces of Armageddon may have been well equipped, but they were wholly unprepared for the waves of violence that swept over their armies. It was clear that the humans underestimated their strategic foes. They had fought orcs before, but these greenskins were different. This was not some petty warlord's assault. This was Wa Gasco. Gasco had beat enough tactics and cunning into the skulls of his commanders that some of it stuck. They easily overwhelmed the planetary defense force legions that advanced out of the planet's hive cities to contain them. First, the orcs launched assaults to pin the foe in place on the flat ash wastes while biker mobs and battle wagon brigades raced around to encircle their foes, cutting off their supply lines. Those that made a desperate attempt to break out were met by gun lines. The orcs mowed down anything that moved. Mech gun batteries pummeled the panicked defenders. With the plains cleared, the orcs advanced on the hive cities, and they were astounded. Built atop sprawling, ash-blown desert wastes, the hive rose up taller than mountains. These were the great factory cities of the Imperium, the lifeblood of its non-stop war effort. This was industrial might on a scale never before seen by the orcs. The Imperium's defense of the hives proved more formidable. The Astra Militarum's numbers were augmented by every regiment available along with hastily armed citizens. Gaskol took one look at High Volcanus before vowing boldly that it would fall in two solar days' times. Although his hordes were numerous enough to overwhelm the gates, 
Gasco did not want to waste his strength. He had yet to unleash the full terror of his gargant big mobs, but he thought that the prodigious firepower should be saved for when it was truly required. Instead, his plan to take the enormous factory city reflected his cunning. The outer barriers were targeted by blitz brigades, armored wedges of battle wagons. The first wave bore rams, and it was their duty to break open the outer walls, using their tracks to carry them over the rubble. The second group of attackers followed in the wake of the smoke-churning orc battle wagons. These were the mobile infantry, mostly goth boys, with mobs of burner boys amongst them. The third wave was composed of scorchas. Their orders were to drive through the breaches and to clear any defenses with sweeping flame. Tractor beams would target the gates as the battle wagons cleared the last trench. Timed correctly, they loaded wagons would be at the top speed just as the doors were ripped off of their hinges. Secondary plans included a Storm Boy's airdrop and stompas with wrecking balls. When the waves of infantry were finally released, they could enter Volcanus at will. Gasco's plan worked almost too well. The hive would have fallen in a single day were it not for its fierce resistance. Despite their heroics, hundreds of thousands of orcs swept onto Hive Volcanus, and its population was massacred or enslaved. After the capture of Hive Volcanus, the remaining hives of Armageddon Prime soon followed. What were once Manufactura were converted to workshops swarming with orcs. Human slaves were worked to death, stripping their own cities of every scrap or resource that the mechs could use to fuel the green skin war machine. Being somewhat soft, it is extraordinary for Humes to gain respect from orcs, especially green skins led by a stoic and battle hungry goth like Gaskol. Although Space Marines regarded with esteem for their skill in battle, none more so than Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, it was an Imperial Commissar, Sebastian Yarrick, that drew the most admiration from the Orcs. Commissar Yarrick was certainly a thorn in Gascoigne's side for the Greenskins reckoned that it was he alone that willed the defenders of Hades' Hive to hold on for so long. To earn more than Gascoigne's eternal enemy, please check out our 40 facts on Commissar Yarrick. Amongst the boys, it was said that those orcs that recognized who they were up against were always slain, for they stood in gape-jaw disbelief at Yarrick's insulting puniness, and so left themselves open to a death blow. When Armageddon's season of shadows set in, the cynical time when the planet's volcanic mountains erupted, the turbulent skies were permanently crimson. To the orcs, this was another sign of their impending victory. The Wa proceeded southwards towards the heavy populated continent of Armageddon Segundus. To get to Armageddon Segundus, the Oryx had to cross a swath of equatorial jungle considered impenetrable by the humans. The swamp region was full of mud pits that could submerge entire armies at a time, and it was filled with ferocious wild beasts. The greenskins reveled in it, attacking the flora and fauna while the mechs erected pontoon bridges or projected force fields across the sinking bogs. Infantry, armored columns, stampa mobs, and towering gargants crossed the crude bridges and emerged on the far side of the jungles. Once again, the orcs caught the humans unprepared and smashed through their defensive positions easily. As the orcs raced across the ash deserts toward the hive cities, the towering god engines and tank companies of mankind advanced out into the barrens to meet them. In the parched desert known as the Death Barrens, a land armada of Death Dreads, Kilicons, and hulking Morkonauts lurched into enemy armor fortifications. Power claws ripped apart turrets, buzz saws, arms reached into tanks to slice up exposed crew, and the screams of the victims ran out like music to the orcs' ears. With the foe's tanks reduced to smoking wreckage, the Stampas and Death Dreads used their firepower to tip the scales on the evenly matched duel between the Gargants and the Titans. 
The sieges that followed brought the Armageddon War to a new state of savagery. The orcs sacked in Furnace Hive after the Blood Axes struck a deal with its corrupt governor. On the Hive cities of Hades and Hell's Reach, the Imperial side launched virus bombs, wicked and prescribed technology from their distant past. Hundreds of thousands of orcs died, but still they pressed on battering themselves against the Hive cities for little gain. With his sub-commanders confused on how to break through these hive cities, Gaskell was forced to direct the assaults himself. He tried many ploys, lightning assaults, overwhelming wave attacks, and mass bombardments. Airdropped storm boys attacked from the skies while the sewer tunnels were infiltrated by the craftiest of commandos. At Hell's Reach, these strategies paid off, each offensive advancing more deeply into that seaport hive city. With the streets red with blood, Gaskell's final tactic to gather the weird boys together so that their wall, minds blasted forth a psychic storm, worked perfectly. Paralyzed by madness, the defenders were overrun. In Hades, each of Gaskell's moves were parried. The storm boys were ripped from the skies by anti-aircraft fire. The commandos were met by tunnel fighters in a running battle that stymied the underground advance. Siege engines were sabotaged by human suicide teams, and the Gargans, even those, were taken down. The defense of Hades' hive was masterminded by Commissar Yarik, who was destined to become the most respected Yumi that Wa Gaskell ever met. As Gaskell fixated on tearing Hades' hive apart, on his command another Auric army was set to overwhelm the hive city of Archeon. On a typical bloody day, the skies shine bright as an orbital bombardment blasted craters amongst the orc hordes. Even as they looked skywards, they saw thunderhawks peel out of the clouds, the roar of their engines audible over the concussive shockwave of their bombing runs. The space marines, the finest warriors in the Emperor's service, had arrived. The blood angels, the ultramarines, and the salamanders attacked and the orcs tasted the bitterness of crushing defeat for the first time. At this time, Gaskell should have confronted the new foes head-on, but instead he observed with bringing down Hades' hive. This could have driven the Space Marine assault back, but instead Gaskell continued his attack on the hive city. Finally, Gaskell's own bully boys broke down the last blast door. With their inner gates now open, Gaskell threw everything at the Hive City, unleashing his final rampage. The Space Marines arrived too late to save Hades' Hive. Those inside were massacred to nearly a man. With his numbers depleted and widely scattered, Gaskell commanded the last of his reinforcements to besiege Tartarus' Hive. The Space Marines were quick to redeploy. A drop pot assault struck the orcs even as Gorkonauts and Stampas smash the hive gates down. Blindsided again, the greenskins were pushed back and on the verge of breaking when Gaskell arrived. His counterattack was just beginning to wrest the initiative back when Gaskell and his bodyguards disappeared altogether. Rumors that their great war boss had fallen spread like wildfire amongst the orcs as they wavered and broke. With this, the Imperium thought they had driven the orcs from Armageddon. The reality was that many orcs fought their way into the ash wastes and escaped, eventually reaching the depths of the equatorial jungles. The planet would never completely get rid of these orcs. Gaskell was not slain. Some say the hand of Gork reached down to save his chosen one. Gaskell's few orc detractors claimed that he had fled, but the reality was that war boss, Gaskell escaped off planet. After leaving Armageddon, he was not idle. He did not look upon the campaign as a defeat, but more as a necessity, a stumble that was part of a larger journey for a master plan that had been revealed to him by Gork and Mork. If the Imperium made one huge mistake following the Second War for Armageddon, it was in not immediately pursuing Gaskell with all their strength and available resources. In truth, the Imperium's high command on Armageddon presumed that the orc warlord that came out of nowhere to ravage their planet was either dead, or if he had survived the battle, 
would be a washed up nothing. He might live for some time as a recluse, but if he attempted to gather more orcs, he would be slain as a failure. After losing a major battle, orcs will often kill their failed leaders. Gaskell did not have to remind some tribes of his greatness by defeating his challengers in a horrific fashion. However, the warlord regained his followers full support, not just with his fists, but with his words. What the orc gods had revealed to Gaskell was that in order to destroy your foe, you must first know him. To the orc, such an idea was both radical and profound. This meant that, for Gaskell, the whole invasion of Armageddon was merely a way to test the waters, an experiment to learn how the Imperium would react against a massive invasion. Now, he had learned what he needed to know about the Imperium's strategies. It was time to regroup, to gather new armies, to rebuild, and to restore the Waw, until it had strength enough to menace entire star systems once again. Most of Gaskell's forces had been left behind in Armageddon. Only a core of his most trusted mobs were with Gaskell when he landed in the heart of what was notorious Orc territory, the world of Golgotha. In ages past, the Golgotha subsector had been heavily colonized by mankind, but since then it had passed through the grasp of various races until it was ultimately conquered by the Orcs. That Wa, however, had run out of Impestus long ago, leaving behind many desperate and interfuting tribes. Just like on Urk, Gaskell began subjugating the Greenskins. At first, he clubbed bosses and gained new bobs, one at a time. But news travels fast when orcs begin to get excited. Whether it was due to the tremendous power of his adamantium skull, or the orcish wisdom he had received from his visions of Gork and Mork, soon whole tribes began seeking out this new warlord. During this time, Commissar Yarik continued to pursue the renegade orc warlord obsessively. Gaskell proclaimed that as the chosen of Gork and Mork, he was the only one who could defeat the Yumi with the evil eye. Gaskell understood that he had to exhaust the Commissar before attacking him head on. He would achieve this by seemingly running away and remaining just out of reach of his pursuers, sacrificing to Yarik those of his underlings who would disobey or challenge him. He did this for ten standard years until he could spring his trap on his pursuers, luring them to the planet of Golgotha. He blinded the exhausted and overstretched human commanders with a chance for victory over his seemingly depleted orc force. For more details on the trap, please check out our 40 facts on Commissar Yarik. The result of the trap was that Gazgul finally captured Yarik as he made his last stand. Gazgul wanted to use Yarik to assert his dominance over the other orcs and to prove that he understood how humans worked. Gazgul predicted Yarik's escape and he was able to stop him before the entire ship he was captured in was destroyed. The other orcs were convinced that Gaskell could indeed predict the human's behavior, and he ordered Mad Doc Grotznik to return the human's bionics. Gaskell then had Yarik escorted by his boys to an intact shuttlecraft, where he allowed the human to leave the Space Hulk, telling him to prepare for the orcs' return to Armageddon. Carefully, Gaskell balanced marshalling the growing numbers of his army and the exponential wall energy alongside the need to keep a low profile for the time being. Never before had an orc leader tried to limit the numbers of orcs he attracted, but it was all part of the plan. Before he could take the next step towards ultimate victory, Gaskell would need more than just an enormous army. He would need to have his new tactics perfected and his new weapons working properly. Gatskul's war was devastating Armageddon. Billions of lives had been lost in an unending battle. It was a place where the mightiest war machines in the galaxy clashed, and heroes died in droves. Just south of the plains of Anthrad, a vital water processing plant known as Gantan Bay, was the site of the battle that escalated to become the largest dreadnought conflict of the entire campaign. 
Large vehicles could not navigate the maze of pipes that made up the vast refinery, and without armor to oppose them, the dread mobs were unstoppable forces, able to gun down or smash aside all human infantry that dared defend those twisted corridors. The orcs were only checked by the arrival of the Space Marine Dreadnoughts from no fewer than five different chapters. Tank busters and Space Marine Devastators moved into the tangled pipelines, hoping to shift the balance upon the deadly battlefield. Although the orcs were ultimately forced to withdraw, the damage brought upon the facility by the Greenskins was irreparable, cutting off water to much of Armageddon Prime. As the war raged on, orcs from across the galaxy felt the vibrations of the war. Like moths to a flame, the most aggressive greenskins were being drawn towards Armageddon, seeking fame and glory. The third war of Armageddon had spread beyond the planet, for the whole subsector was flooded with orc raiders. Those worlds, left vulnerable by the Imperial commitment to Armageddon, were now completely destroyed. Within the Armageddon sector was the better part of 17 Imperial Navy fleets defending the sector. A rumor spread that Godskull had called Ragnarok the Great Wa, the final apocalyptic battle in which the orcs would prove their worth before the eyes of their violent and primitive gods. To counter the orcs, the Imperium had been forced into a total war, sacrificing entire planetary populations worth of troops to the planet. A thousand light year recruitment zone was established around Armageddon. Every Imperial world within that area had to come up with triple the amount of Imperial Guard regiments, and their industry turned over solely to increase production. Along with countless Imperial Guard regiments at the least 24 different chapters of Adeptus Astartes, several Ordos of Adeptus Sororitas and six Titan Legions battled at Armageddon. The war became less about saving Armageddon and more about preserving its subsector, and most sobering of all, preventing the ever-swelling tide of orcs from growing larger. If the Great Green Menace could not be contained upon Armageddon, then it would sweep onward and threaten Holy Terra. On the orc side, the Great Green Vision was now self-perpetuating, and Godskull was needed to spread the ripples of Wa energy until they washed the galaxy in blood. Only the pull of destiny could drag the most dangerous orc warlord away from the battle that raged across Armageddon. Godskull could feel the pressure building up behind his adamantium plate. He was about to have another vision, and if the pain was any indication, it was going to be a monumental one. Godskull returned to his orbiting ship, Kilreka, and at last gave in to the green flashes that were filling his patchwork mind. The voice of Gork and Mork had never been so strong, their bellowing still echoing in Godskull's head. Yet no matter how many times he readjusted his thinking parts by beating them against the bulwark of the ship, Godskull could not clear his head, nor decipher what the guttered voice of the gods were saying to him. Godskull did not know exactly what he was looking for, and grasped only that he would not find it in Armageddon. Trusting that the voices would become clearer with time, he ordered a handful of void crafts from the fleet that still surrounded Armageddon to gather around Kilreka. Gotskul left Armageddon. Gotskul left the battle for Armageddon, knowing his appointed lieutenants would command in his steed, and as he had ordered, his only regret was that he doubted he would ever be back before his underlings conquered everything in his name. As Gotskul's ship left the sector, he ordered a herd of weird boy warpheads to gather. It was his hope that the deranged orc mystics could aid his visions in a way similar to how their strange gifts seemed to help steer the best course once a space hawk entered the warp. The hulking warlord watched the drooling warpheads totter about the bridge, bumping into each other like boys under the influence of fungus beer. They did nothing to help the warlord's vision. 
Imperial Augur stations observe the vessel known as Kilraka leave the sector. The Armageddon High Command was notified, and within solar days, the pursuit was underway. Commissar Yarik headed one fleet, and the High Marshal of the Black Templars led the other. They had allowed Gatskul to escape once, and it cost them dearly, a mistake Yarik vowed that would never be repeated. Using a pincer approach, the faster, more efficient Imperial warships converted upon the Orc fleet several solar weeks after leaving Armageddon. Outnumbered in the midst of a barren space known as the Haunted Gulf, Godskull realized he could not outrun his foes. With nowhere to hide, he ordered the fleet to steer directly into the midst of the enemy. The Orc flotilla crippled several battle cruisers as it crashed into the Imperial fleets. The Imperium returned fire, destroying Orc void ships one after another. Kilrucka was left incapable of steering. As Yarik and Helbrick prepared to board the Orc vessel in order to personally ensure Godskull's demise, Kilrucka was consumed in a blaze of green energy. Kilrucka rocked back and forth from the land strikes that penetrated its lower decks. The resulting explosion blasted concussive forces throughout the ship, making the entire Voidcraft lurk violently and sending everyone on the command deck sprawling. Gatskul toppled over hard, his adamantium-clad skull denting the steel deck plates with a clang. Furious, he pushed out of the pile of weird boys that had shifted on top of him. It was then, his head still ringing from the impact, that an overwhelming force possessed Gatskul. An arcing crown of green lightning exploded outwards, washing everyone in a strange green light. The sudden explosion of energies was a spark that set off the warpheads, each convulsing in a rhythmic spasm that grew in intensity. Engulfed in green flames, the crazed orc psychers howled as their skin sizzled and raw power bursted forth from their eyes and gushed from their jaws. In voices like rolling thunder, the warpeds spoke as one, the same almighty roar of Gork and Mork that Godskull had been hearing. Now at last he understood what he needed to do. The voice of the gods commanded Godskull to unite the orcs and make the galaxy echo to the sounds of the Great Wa. The powerful voice spoke again, saying that only unending battle would call the final Ragnarok bringing forth Gork and Mork themselves. With their role in delivering the message done, the warpheads exploded in a vast outpouring of energy, drenching all those on the command deck with the wet viscery and luminescent green energy. It was this surge of green power that rolled outwards, striking the enemy fleets like a tidal wave. With their ship systems ensnarled by strange energies, Yarik and Helbrick could only watch in frustration as Kilrecca blinked once and was gone. Kilrecca was hurled into the warp, its course and destination unknown. Every greenskin on board endured an unsettling journey in which the echoes of the mighty voices still boomed in their minds. How long they traveled or where they spun towards, none could say. Then, with a feeling similar to a punch in the gut, they halted, reappearing, suddenly in real space. The orc staggered to the portholes, looking out and gasping in amazement. They were completely surrounded by void ships of all sizes, but there could be no mistaking the make of such crude, rust buckets like crafts. Kilrecca had materialized precisely in the middle of an orc fleet. Kilrecca had landed in the middle of Warlord Urgok, the Slayer's fleet. The Warlord mistook the Kilrecca for space junk, thinking that some scraps, mongering death skulls, were simply cutting up pieces of the old wreckage. What he was seeing was Gatskul's mechs repairing the Kilrecca after being tossed around in the warp. On board, Godskull cared less about the hull repairs, instead ordering his mechs to fix the damage teleporter. He was going to confront the warlord. Knowing his advantage was surprise, Godskull trusted his luck and teleported blindly, 
as if guided by the great green hands of Gork and Mork themselves. Gotskul and a mob of his baddest knobs, his bully boys, appeared in a green flash in a warlord Urgut's command room. Before they could recover from their shock, most of Urgut's bodyguards were slain, and Gotskul had pulled Urgut off his throne and beat him senseless. So started a new war. Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40k Universe. Today we continue with part 6 of the God School Thraka 40 Facts videos. So let's get into 40 Facts About God School Thraka. God School's war was devastating Armageddon. Billions of lives had been lost in an unending battle. It was a place where the mightiest war machines in the galaxy clashed, and heroes died in droves. Just south of the plains of Anthrad, a vital water processing plant known as Gantan Bay was the site of the battle that escalated to become the largest dreadnought conflict of the entire campaign. Large vehicles could not navigate the maze of pipes that made up the vast refinery, and without armor to oppose them, the dread mobs were unstoppable forces able to gun down or smash aside all human infantry that dared defend those twisted corridors. The orcs were only checked by the arrival of the Space Marine Dreadnoughts from no fewer than five different chapters. Tank busters and Space Marine Devastators moved into the tangled pipelines, hoping to shift the balance upon the deadly battlefield. Although the orcs were ultimately forced to withdraw, the damage brought upon the facility by the Greenskins was irreparable, cutting off water to much of Armageddon Prime. As the war raged on, orcs from across the galaxy felt the vibrations of the war. Like moths to a flame, the most aggressive Greenskins were being drawn towards Armageddon, seeking fame and glory. The third war of Armageddon had spread beyond the planet for the whole subsector was flooded with orc raiders. Those worlds left vulnerable by the imperial commitment to Armageddon were now completely destroyed. Within the Armageddon sector was the better part of 17 imperial navy fleets defending the sector. A rumor spread that Godskull had called Ragnarok the Great Wa. The final apocalyptic battle in which the orcs would prove their worth before the eyes of their violent and primitive gods. To counter the orcs, the Imperium had been forced into a total war, sacrificing entire planetary populations worth of troops to the planet. A thousand light year recruitment zone was established around Armageddon. Every Imperial world within that area had to come up with triple the amount of Imperial Guard regiments and their industry turned over solely to increase production. Along with countless Imperial Guard regiments at the least 24 different chapters of Adeptus Astartes, several Ordos of Adeptus Sororitis and six Titan Legions battled at Armageddon. The war became less about saving Armageddon and more about preserving its subsector. And most sobering of all, preventing the ever-swelling tide of orcs from growing larger. If the great green menace could not be contained upon Armageddon, then it would sweep onward and threaten Holy Terra. On the orc side, the great green vision was now self-perpetuating, and Godskull was needed to spread the ripples of wah energy until they washed the galaxy in blood. Only the pull of destiny could drag the most dangerous orc warlord away from the battle that raged across Armageddon. Godskull could feel the pressure building up behind his adamantium plate. He was about to have another vision, and if the pain was any indication, it was going to be a monumental one. Godskull returned to his orbiting ship, Kilreka and at last gave in to the green flashes that were filling his patchwork mind. The voice of Gork and Mork had never been so strong, their bellowing still echoing in Godskull's head. Yet no matter how many times he readjusted his thinking parts by beating them against the bulwark of the ship, Godskull could not clear his head, nor decipher what the guttered voice of the gods were saying to him. 
Gottskull did not know exactly what he was looking for, and grasped only that he would not find it in Armageddon. Trusting that the voices would become clearer with time, he ordered a handful of void crafts from the fleet that still surrounded Armageddon to gather around Kilreka. Gottskull left Armageddon. Gottskull left the battle for Armageddon, knowing his appointed lieutenants would command in his steed, and as he had ordered, his only regret was that he doubted he would ever be back before his underlings conquered everything in his name. As Gottskull's ship left the sector, he ordered a herd of weird boy warpeds to gather. It was his hope that the deranged orc mystics could aid his visions in a way similar to how their strange gifts seemed to help steer the best course once a space hawk entered the warp. The hulking warlord watched the drooling warpeds totter about the bridge, bumping into each other like boys under the influence of fungus beer. They did nothing to help the warlord's vision. Imperial Augur stations observed the vessel, known as Kilraka, leave the sector. The Armageddon High Command was notified, and within solar days, the pursuit was underway. Commissar Yarik headed one fleet, and the High Marshal of the Black Templars led the other. They had allowed Gatskul to escape once, and it cost them dearly, a mistake Yarik vowed that would never be repeated. Using a pincer approach, the faster, more efficient Imperial warships converted upon the Orc fleet several solar weeks after leaving Armageddon. Outnumbered in the midst of a barren space known as the Haunted Gulf, Godskull realized he could not outrun his foes. With nowhere to hide, he ordered the fleet to steer directly into the midst of the enemy. The Orc flotilla crippled several battle cruisers as it crashed into the Imperial fleets. The Imperium returned fire, destroying Orc void ships one after another. Kilraka was left incapable of steering. As Yarik and Helbrick prepared to board the Orc vessel in order to personally ensure Godskull's demise, Kilraka was consumed in a blaze of green energy. Kilraka rocked back and forth from the land strikes that penetrated its lower decks. The resulting explosion blasted concussive forces throughout the ship, making the entire Voidcraft lurk violently and sending everyone on the command deck sprawling. Gottskull toppled over hard, his adamantium clad skull denting the steel deck plates with a clang. Furious, he pushed out of the pile of weird boys that had shifted on top of him. It was then, his head still ringing from the impact, that an overwhelming force possessed Gottskull. An arcing crown of green lightning exploded outwards, washing everyone in a strange green light. The sudden explosion of energies was a spark that set off the warpeds, each convulsing in a rhythmic spasm that grew in intensity. Engulfed in green flames, the crazed orc psychers howled as their skin sizzled and raw power bursted forth from their eyes and gushed from their jaws. In voices like rolling thunder, the warped spoke as one, the same almighty roar of Gork and Mork that Godskull had been hearing. Now at last he understood what he needed to do. The voice of the gods commanded Godskull to unite the orcs and make the galaxy echo to the sounds of the Great Wa. The powerful voice spoke again, saying that only unending battle would call the final Ragnarok, bringing forth Gork and Mork themselves. With their role in delivering the message done, the warpheads exploded in a vast outpouring of energy drenching all those on the command deck with the wet viscery and luminescent green energy. It was this surge of green power that rolled outwards, striking the enemy fleets like a tidal wave. With their ship systems ensnarled by strange energies, Yarik and Helbrick could only watch in frustration as Kilreka blinked once and was gone. Kilreka was hurled into the warp, its course and destination unknown. Every greenskin on board endured an unsettling journey in which the echoes of the mighty voices still boomed in their minds. 
How long they traveled or where they spun towards, none could say. Then with a feeling similar to a punch in the gut, they halted, reappearing, suddenly in real space. The orc staggered to the portholes, looking out and gasping in amazement. They were completely surrounded by void ships of all sizes, but there could be no mistaking the make of such crude, rust buckets like crafts. Kilreka had materialized precisely in the middle of an orc fleet. Kilreka had landed in the middle of Warlord Urgok the Slayer's fleet. The Warlord mistook the Kilreka for space junk, thinking that some scraps mongering death skulls were simply cutting up pieces of the old wreckage. What he was seeing was Gotskul's mechs repairing the Kilraka after being tossed around in the warp. On board, Gotskul cared less about the hull repairs, instead ordering his mechs to fix the damaged teleporter. He was going to confront the warlord. Knowing his advantage was surprise, Gotskul trusted his luck and teleported blindly, as if guided by the great green hands of Gork and Mork themselves. Gotskul and a mob of his baddest knobs, his bully boys, appeared in a green flash in a warlord Urgut's command room. Before they could recover from their shock, most of Urgut's bodyguards were slain, and Gotskul had pulled Urgut off his throne and beat him senseless. So started a new war. Gotskul was the new owner of a vast armada, but like all orc-made creations, the ships that made up the fleet were built out of cast-off metal scavenged from the ends of the galaxy. Others had once been vessels of some other race, but had been salvaged and upgraded by the orcs. It was not the green skin way to repair things, they would merely patch over shells and add more DACA to the ships. Some had even come from distant eras, having been found drifting in the warp. Within the ramshackle armada was a pair of heavy-powered hammer battle cruisers that had stood head-to-head -head with Imperial battleships and come out victorious. Some half-dozen kill cruisers and terror ships rounded out the larger void ships. Before them came a tide of lesser vessels, some little more than rust buckets with thruster engines, yet they were deadly despite their worn and crappy appearance. The pride of the fleet was Urgok Spacehawk, a colossal of a starcraft with firepower to almost equal that of any entire Imperial battle fleet. Urgok's fleet was substantial in size before Gatsku arrived, but it grew exponentially when the prophet of Gork and Mork took over. Warlord Urgutk's empire had grown so large that it took solar weeks for Godskull to work his way around. Most joined the prophet of Gork and Mork willingly, but some stubborn cases needed to be shown a few messy examples before they too saw the wisdom of aligning themselves with Godskull. When he regained consciousness, Urgok the Slayer himself became a leader within Gotskul's throng, and this made recruiting the rest of the armies easier. If the galaxy was going to be set ablaze with Wa energy, many more orcs were needed. It would be the work of a million lifetimes to seek out every green skin held territory, to travel to innumerable places where green skins gathered in dominating numbers. Countless moons, planets, asteroid fields, or space hawks drifting in the void between the stars. Gatsku knew orcs were called by the power of Wa. He would not go searching for the boys. Boys would come to him. Under Gatsku, a flood of greenskins rushed to join the fleet. He now had to give them purpose. With orc hordes roaring for battle, Gotskul steered the fleet toward the orc territory of Octarius. Rumor had come of a new leader of the realm, and it was Gotskul's intent to wrestle the title of Overfiend of Octarius for himself. However, what he found when he got there was even better. Octarius had been orc territory for many thousands of standard years. It was not as backwater as subsector as Urk had been. And every so often, a leader would rise up and call a war, and lead an invasion off to wreck some part of the galaxy. The old warlord, Gorsnik Magash, 
whom held the title of Orverfiend of Octurius, left to join Gatskul in Armageddon long ago. He was still fighting the Imperium, holding his own in the dead lands of Armageddon after the Prophet had left. Since Gorsnik's departure, a new leader quickly rose to fill the power vacuum and claim the title Overfiend of Octurius, a Death Skull warlord named Zog Steeltooth. Despite his copious use of blue war paint, the rule of Zog Steeltooth had thus far not been a lucky one. Tyranids plagued the sector, consuming entire planets as they advanced. The epicenter of the fighting was upon the planet of Octoria. The ever-evolving spawn of High Fleet Leviathan were gaining the upper hand, showering the planet with reinforcements, sending yet further broods of killing beasts into the non-stop melee. Across Octoria, the orcs were forced to take refuge in scrap iron fortifications. It seemed only a matter of time before the Tyranids collapsed each of the jury-rigged fortresses. Then Wa Gatskul descended from the spore-ridden skies. At first, the Overfiend's orcs thought the rocks blazing through the atmosphere were some kind of new foe. All across Octoria they landed, smashing gaping holes through the gargoyle-filled skies and plummeting into scuttling hordes on the ground. Gotskul's boys surged outward, taking the fight to the Tyranids while the rocks themselves opened up with heavy fire. The greenskins behind their shabby defenses let loose volleys of cheers and hails of supporting fire of their own. Tyranid response was extremely quick. Large swarm creatures, hulking limbed horrors, and gargant-sized beasts lumbered to oppose the new green skin threat from the skies. Octurious orcs were silenced by these new Tyranid creatures, for they knew that these towering behemoths had been held in reserve. Now the newcomers would be shredded, for there could be no hope for infantry out in the open. To their surprise, the air flashed as teleporters began to bring more reinforcements. All across Octoria, the crated rocks landing sites now blazed with unnatural lights. After each flash, more and more mobs appeared, and these were not just infantry. Arriving with gunfire, gargants and stampas concentrated their fire on the larger foes, while at their feet, Burnaboy mobs spread out. With each blast from their weapon, they sent blossoms of red fire leaping out to flash fry the lesser creatures in droves. Amidst the mob pouring forth, countless crude banners and totems could be seen, carrying high the newly arrived troops or mounted atop clanging battle wagons. The orcs of Octoria saw the symbol and knew who had arrived. At Gargates, the Overfiend's shanty capital, Gatskul Thraka himself appeared via teleporter. He led the charge at the head of his bully boys as they crashed through the serpentine raveners that were beginning to undermine the first line of defense. To the green skins that watched, this massive warlord in mega armor fought like Gork himself. He wove in and out of sight in swirling carnage, but he was easy to pick out. An aura of green brutality seemed to surround him, and he clobbered each of his foes so hard that limbs, heads, claws, and flesh arced all around him. He moved like some elemental destructive force, a one orc wave of destruction. His custom shooter spat death, and with every swipe, Gatskul's power claw sliced multiple foes in half. Every motion, from his elbow backswinging to the stomp of his iron foot, the Tyranids were in trouble. Suddenly, the ground underneath Gatskul began to bulge upward, and in a second, a Moloch larger than any Tyranid seen by the orcs devoured Gatskul. The screeching that bursted through the beescaping maw made orcs miles away fall and cover their ears. But as quickly as the Moloch screamed victoriously, it began to heave and flop. An unnatural bulge formed in its midsection and out thrusted a power claw. Shoot a blast widened the hole and out stepped Gatskul, striding out of the belly of the beast. The mightiest of orc warlords roared his victory to the skies, a rally cry to greenskins and a challenge to all else that lived. After that, 
Nothing could stop the orcs. Chanting their warlord's name, the green skin of Wa God School went on a killing rampage, hacking, shooting, and slaying in the berserker frenzy. From behind scrap iron walls, the orcs of Octoria bursted forth to join in. Even Zog Steeltooth, the overfiend of Octorius, was chanting the name of God School as he gunned down the living walls of Tyranids that attempted to stay the Greenskin onslaught. Though God School had little time to prepare, he made the most of it. Mechs welded iron plated walls back into position, or patched acid eaten holes. Others sighted new cannons and anti aircraft weapons, better integrating the rocks into the overall defense. Under the keen eye of the great Big Mech Orchimedes, a few snazzy upgrades from the teleporter pads to pulse rockets would give the intergalactic aliens something new to chew on. To the orcs, this fight looked to be bigger and better than the one in Armageddon. Looking up, God School twisted his fang-like teeth in as close to a grin as he could manage. This wa was only getting started. The great butchery began, and it would not stop until Octoria was free of the creatures of the Leviathan. Since leaving Armageddon, the visions that temporarily filled God School's brain had become more frequent. They showed him brief snippets of the action back in Armageddon. God School saw Zagboss, Scargrim, tearing it up on his warbike, or watch Commando Clank lead his boys to another victory. Despite the vast distance, God School swore his voice carried through the visions and reached his lieutenants, and he was correct. God School orders were reaching Armageddon in the form of a tormented vision. God School understood that once the battle on Octoria got going, it would be time to leave. He had a destiny to meet. Gork and Mork's voices were beckoning clearer and clearer. God School only needed three or four more sectors raging with battle to swell the orc population to critical mass. He could then fulfill his vision. In his vision, God School was stomping across the galaxy. His stride spanned stars beyond count, and each of his mighty footprints were swaths of planets aflame with war. Armageddon, Octoria, he was already anxious to start the next one. Despite what the growing orc legends say, the true genius of God School Thraka had nothing to do with his rock splitting headbutt. What really set God School apart was his leadership. Few warlords could mesh the different clans, playing each to its strengths, rather than leaving them to work towards their own narrow-minded and individual goals. Scattered about Wa God School were a range of the most talented orcs to stalk the galaxy. This was not a formal council, but a loose ring of the most powerful and influential war bosses from the tribes, along with the most achieved odd boys. Perhaps the most famous amongst this group was Orchimedes, the genius mech behind such inventions as the Teleporta and the Attack Umersibles. When he remained lucid, Mad Doc Grotznik was also in this group, as was the Evil Sun's warlord, Zagbos Scargrim. The aged, but still mighty, snakebite Grand Tusk chieftain, Molok, and militant-minded Commandant Clank of the Blood Axes were both part of Wa God School. Nazdrag of the Bad Moons and perhaps a dozen others, even when God School was not nearby, these dynamic lieutenants acted in his name. They became the right hand of Wa God School. Being a goth himself, God School preferred to use battle-hardened mobs of goths whenever he could. God School utilized the Gore Boys, which was a mob of 20 of the toughest boys led by Nob Ulk. Bolzak's Destroyers was a war horde of Goths led by warboss Bolzak, consisting of 30 Bullseye Boys, 30 Hornhelms, 10 Firks Truck Boys, a Death Dread called Ripkill, and a Gorkonaut note as Git Stampa. Grand Warlord Golg's Warhorde consisted of 200 boys that called themselves Crim's Crumpas, 150 boys from the Bloody Choppas, 100 boys that called themselves Steelheads, Dirk's Dreadmob, and their Stampa Godcracker, 
all led by war boss Golg. Gatskul valued mobility, so it is no surprise that at the heart of his Wa can be found many Blitz Brigades. While all the clans are represented, Gatskul put extra stock in those from his own clan, the Goth Blitz Boys. Blitz Brigades are motorized columns of trucks and battle wagons, each carrying a bloodthirsty mob of orcs. Goth Blitz Boys have learned to carry extra weapons as the tuck and roll of rapid deployment and the sheer recklessness of their assault have been known to knock a few loose. Found in Goth Blitz Boys are Gurgat's mob, which consists of 20 boys led by Nob Gurgat himself in his battle wagon, the Meat Wagon. Black Death Blitz Brigade is led by Zog Blackclaw and five battle wagons with death rollers and a mob of the toughest boys. Kragrat's Blitz Daka Warband is led by Warboss Kragrak and can almost always be seen riding with two trucks full of goth boys, three battle wagons with death rollers, two war tracks, and ten of his knobs on their war bikes, all supported by his Daka Jet. Got School can always rely on Crossnick's Death Track tribe when he needs more mobility. Warboss Cracksnick maintains four warbands and 32 battle fortresses. Ugrex Uglies are part of the battle hardened core of Goths that form the center of Wa God School. If you can recall from previous videos, Ugrek was a Goth champion on Urk who pledged loyalty to the Prophet after a gigantic headbutt. It was a board world killer. Having risen in prominence since then, Ugrek now leads an entire Goth warband, the Uglies. They are relentless, foot slogging infantry with boys and knobs in heavy armor, often much scratched and worn by the rigors of close combat. At various times, Ugrek's Uglies have acted as Got School's personal bodyguard and they have the honor of leading the spearhead attack that helped break down the final blast door of Hades Hive. Like a traditional goth, Gotskul places a great value on brutal close range violence. A variety of killicons, death dreads, and even larger walkers can be found fighting alongside or amidst the goth infantry. These metal monstrosities clank alongside them, greatly augmenting their hitting power. School has learned through experience to gather the Kilicons and Death Dreads together into armor wedges, smoke spewing, lurching units that can stomp down enemy hordes or hack through enemy elite. While it is true that the Goths despise lowly Gretchen, most have learned a grudging respect for those managing to pilot the Kilicons. Kilicons are readily accepted into Goth warbands, as well as formidable Dread Mobs because of the Gretchen's ability to blast, stomp, and maul his foe. Then again, it is possible that many goth boys simply don't know that there is a grot inside. Such an excellent killing machine. In Wa Got School, you'll find Crud's Can Dread Mob, consisting of three Death Dreads, three Kilicons, two Morganauts, all supported by a Painboy Olgrag, led by Big Meg Crud. Blackhorn's Dread Mob is led by Big Meg Snarga Lugnuts, and he basically copied the previous warband. Stompy Death Dread Mob is led by Big Meg Gurk and supported by Doc Morgrog. His mob is full of all kinds of orky walkers, from Morganauts to Killicons. Within Big Mech Gurk's Stompy Death Dread Mob lies a Gorkonaut worshipped by the orcs as a god. The blocky metal death machine single-handedly halted a Humi counterattack during the Third War of Armageddon. The awestruck orc boys who followed in his wake were well impressed with the trail of destruction the war engine left behind. They passed, flipped over armored personnel carriers, their hulls ripped open and the humans inside crushed flat. Entire squadrons of enemy soldiers lay in ruin from which the gory track marks of the Gorkonauts rolled on. At last, catching up to the hard-driving war engine, the orcs witnessed such a great display of violence. 
the Gorgonaut broke through the defensive lines, scattering the Humi guns and equipment and thrusting its claw of Gork straight into the Imperial bunkers as orcs chanted, Mangler, Mangler, Mangler. The Mangler is piloted by the hulking knob named Captain Grok. Grok has not let the fact that his Gorgonaut is worshipped as a god go to his head. Instead, he continues to demand the utmost from his crew and reminds the mobs that follow him that they ain't seen nothing yet. One of God School's most trusted speed freak war bosses is war boss Badzag. Him and his speed boys devastated Armageddon, consisting of six knobs on war bikes and his mob of biker boys called the Red Death. Speed freak war boss Sneg Bloodsplat can be found leading his fast sons, which consist of Red Raiders, Fugs Riders, his Death Copter mob called Thwat Deft, Truck Boys called Axles Boys, and his Dakajet Zagnuts Hunter. The largest speed freak war boss was Grand Warlord Gortak and his Go Fasta war horde, consisting of 18 cults of speed warbands. God School also includes orc commando mobs into his great wall. Commandos work well in goth warbands as they have a great respect from other orcs because of their fighting skills and discipline. Commandos like Boss Knob Bullrag and his Fighting Fifth consist of four of the sneakiest commandos. Kraga's Camel Boys consist of two commando mobs and a death dread led by commando boss Kraga. All the commando mobs God School has ever employed, none have gathered more fame than boss Nickrot and his Red Skull commandos. To this day, they still haunt the shadows of Armageddon. Boss Nickrot commands four great commando mobs, and we will have a 40 facts on boss Nickrot. So subscribe to the channel for that. On the ash wastes of Armageddon, God School found his mobile blitz brigade and even his stampa mobs were being hunted down by fast moving imperial sentinels. To combat these enemies without slowing down the main thrust of his advances, God School ordered his flanks protected by mobs of trucks and battle wagons, mounted heavy hunters, their firepower augmented with a few rocket armed war buggies. Most of these mobs were small in size, allowing them to respond quickly to different threats to the main army's flanks. Upon sighting their foes, the transports would peel off and the troops would deploy on breakneck speeds. Tank buster mobs or looters soon tracked the Imperial light vehicles. Such countermeasures proved extremely effective and soon more and more light detachments of heavy hunter mobs secured the flanks of all large war hordes. One such mob was the Red Rocket's Heavy Hunters, consisting of tank buster mobs in battle wagons and a mob of looters in a truck. Dreg Tooth's Heavy Hunters consisted of two trucks of tank busters, one mob of looters in a battle wagon, and two war buggies. This mob proved to be extremely deadly to any vehicles caught in their sight. The teleporter was a key part of God School's second invasion of Armageddon. Ultimately, all sorts of troops and equipment would be teleported onto the planet, but the first and foremost were carefully chosen teleporter mobs. Knobs in mega armor were almost always included in the first wave of troops arriving via teleporter. Heavily armored, these powerhouses would materialize with guns blazing, often using their combi weapons to ensure that their first volley packed the deadliest punch possible. It was God School's intention to use his teleporter mobs to counter the Space Marine offensive, which had blightened his first campaign at Armageddon. Indeed, some of his mobs were designed marine killers, their troops outfitted with twin kill saws or special one rockets to aid in defeating the Space Marine power armor. The toughest of these teleporter mobs was God School's bull boys, often led by Ugrak. The mob consisted of Ugrak's uglies, the mega knobs, Mob, Redhorn, and Blackhorns. That school likes to hit his foes hard and fast, and few other troops are as brutally effective at this type of lightning warfare as Storm Boys. In Wa God School, mobs of Storm Boys are a common feature in many orc warbands. Their military minded way of thinking fits in perfectly with these goth clans. 
Storm boys use their rocket packs to launch swift strikes against their enemies, either assaulting key objectives, taking out vulnerable foes, or at least causing a nuisance. After claiming to see visions of Gork's anger descending like a thunderbolt from the skies, Gatsuko had the bright idea to mass his storm boys. He first attempted this with some success during the later stage of the Second War of Armageddon. It is not unusual for Storm Boys and Wagat School to bear the extra black and white checks associated with goth mobs or a variety of God School personal symbols, perhaps emblazoned with rocket fuel or marked by lightning bolts. The Chapa Storm mob had even deployed a rude militaristic marching song which they bellowed as they descended into battle, although mercifully the words are typically drowned out by the roars of their rocket packs. Chapa Storm Mob is led by Boss Knob Tora and composed of three Storm Boy mobs, the Death Rockets, Girk's Jump Boys, and Tora's Terras. Battle scarred and grim, only the hardest of hard have what it takes to join the Golf Guard. Some of the orcs in the Golf Guard come from Urk and have stuck by the Warlord through all his travels. Wherever God School can be found, it is rare if the Golf Guard aren't close at hand. Rightfully proud to be associated with the greatest greenskin to live and breathe. There are tons of black banners, golf symbols, and God School's horn silhouettes amongst the golf guard. When the prophet of Gork and Mork cut deep into the Tyranids on Octoria, it was the black armored might of the golf guard that chopped their way behind them. During his first invasion of Armageddon, the Golf Guard took so many banners and Aquila top standards from the Astra Militarum and Adeptus Astartes that they piled them and made a bonfire visible from orbit. The Golf Guard consists of 30 heavy armored boys known as Ardshells, led by Nob Girk. Another part of the warband is a mob of 10 mega knobs with a boss pole called Urks Owned. God School's head bashes consist of five of the toughest war bosses Ugrak, Durg Redclaw, Sirk, the Mighty Bolg, Ugork, the Slayer, all leading three knob mobs, three mega knob mobs, a dread mob, and a stampa mob. Part of the Goth Guard is God School's super heavy battle wagon known as Black Thunder. And finally, Kog's Crushes consist of four warbands and four Gorkonauts. Gatsku had a banner bearer named Makari. He was an exceptionally lucky Grot who survived to the ripe old age of nine standard years before finally meeting his end under the posterior of his hulking master. The plucky Gretchen served as a self-appointed banner waver to the mighty Gatsku Thraka himself. Surviving countless battles in ever more improbable ways, Gatsku saw Makari as something of a mascot. When Makari died, his waving stick was reclaimed, hosed down, and went into service as an impressive boss bull. Good fortune still surrounds the lucky stick, though the backlash when things go wrong can be surprisingly brutal. God School first appeared in White Dwarf Magazine 134. He was the war boss of Andy Chambers' sample golf army list. God School was the weaker of two possible choices for the leaders of the Orc army at that time, the other being a warlord. His attributes of an adamantium skull and the ability to call a wall were randomly generated, although at times they merely conferred an extra headbutt attack in close combat and a minor psychic attack. The psychic power or psychic attack was called Hammerhand and it doubled his attacks once per game. The first God School model was an in-house conversion. God School's next appearance was in the Battle for Armageddon board game, based around the events of the Second War of Armageddon, featuring opposite Commissar Yarrick. Inspired by the game's backstory, Jervis Johnson wrote up special rules for the two characters' use in Warhammer 40,000 and Epic 40,000 games, making God School one of the first two special characters ever released by Games Workshop. The special rules were based on the random attributes selected by Andy Chambers back in God School's first appearance. Rules for God School appeared in the third edition of Warhammer 40k, and a new model was created for the worldwide campaign organized around the Third War of Armageddon. The rules were updated to reflect God School at the point just prior to the outbreak of the Third War. 
God School's war gear consists of cyborg body, mega armor, big shooter, power claw, boss bow, and stick bombs. And we leave you with a quote from the prophet himself. I'm warlord God School Mag Uruk Thraka, and I speak with the word of the gods. I'm the prophet of Dwa, and the whole world burns in my boot print. And those were 40 facts on God School. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We used to do things very differently back then. We would break up uh, the stories into 10 minute segments or like 11 minute segments just because of upload time. When we first started uploading, our internet speed was pretty bad. So it would take like five hours to upload a 10 minute long video. Now there's improvements, not just in, in the internet that we have now, but also the uh, YouTube capabilities, which is why we can just create or we can put out this entire story uh, the way that it was supposed to be um, listened to. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Talk to you guys tomorrow. This is Gersh One with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>